Hey now, and happy Monday. And first things first, we all have our jobs and they're vitally important and they're how we make our day-to-day -day living. Right now, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 has taken over a lot of that. And my best advice is hunker down, follow the rules and stay, find a way to stay positive. Those of you who follow me on Twitter or on Facebook, you see my posts and you know that I try to be the most positive, best possible version of myself that I possibly can. And it's a mindset uh, that I adopted uh, when, you know, I got into a great position in my life uh, for a lot of different reasons. So that's cool. And when you talk about a great position in your life, you think about your family. Uh, I have an amazing relationship with my ex-wife, Jen. And on 20 years ago, Yes, tomorrow, she gave birth. The great Cole Corrigan. Uh, Cole, I will not be on the air tomorrow, but I will be on the air today. So happy birthday, Cole, man. I love you, buddy. It's absolutely fantastic to have you as a vital part of my life, and you make it. You make every day a little bit better. Uh, the other thing I want to do before I call Chris Gunkel, then we got Jerry Byrne, the head coach at Harvard. Then we got Scotty Rose Growney, a player from North Carolina. Then we have Dox Aiken, the player from University of Virginia. Then we're going to have John Nostrand the head coach at Gilman and coached at Hereford School for such a long time. And then we're going to finish it all up with Jamie Monroe. What an absolute treat. Uh, but my dear friend Tanya McGrath lives down in Sarasota, Florida, and there's a young man who plays for Cardinal Mooney Lacrosse, and he suffered a spinal cord injury last week. His name is Michael Bavaro, and his medical bills are adding up. So please think about reaching out uh, to Michael Bavaro and you can just message me on Facebook or Twitter at Booker Corrigan and we can go from there. We'll make a great, great showing from the lacrosse community to bring him some semblance of joy. Spinal cord injuries are tragic events and 99 times out of 100, they are accidents that happen and life has to keep moving forward. Let's make this young man, Michael Bavaro's life, move forward a little bit more easily and his families as well. Let's get on to the show and get my man Chris Gunkel. Gunk played at Loyola College before it was Loyola University from 87 to 90, and now he's an absolutely fantastic broadcaster. Uh, I'm dialing him up right now through the magic of cellular communication. I will be bringing him on the MedStar Coaches Hotline. And we are happy to have him as part of the show. This is Chris. Chris Gunkel, Booker Corrigan here, and you are live on the Booker Corrigan Show on the MedStar Coaches Hotline. Thanks for being a part. Uh, Booker, thanks for having me. I mean it sincerely. I mean, it's, it's nice to at least be able to speak to another human being right now. <laughs> it is. It's trying times. I just talked about that. Uh, I actually even alluded to a kid down at Cardinal Mooney in Sarasota, Florida, uh, who suffered a spinal cord injury. So we're quarantined. He's fighting a bigger struggle. So we're going to try and help the lacrosse community reach out to them and help make their passage through this struggle a little bit easier. Um, so our best wishes to him. Gunk, you played at Loyola between 87 and 1990. Do you think you could play for Loyola right now, my man? Um, I could, Booker, <laughs> because they're not playing. <laughs> That's the only reason that I could play for him. But, um, you know, it's funny you say that. My, my son and I were actually watching the 90 championship game today after yep. I got your text about the content. And um, so considering I didn't really play in the first half of that game, no, I don't think I could play for this current team. Because the, I, But, it, it, you know, to, to make the point, um, the athletes are so much different yep. now. Um, bigger, stronger, faster is what you always hear. And that's really true. I think the, the the players now come in knowing the game so much better, and they're so much more technically sound um, that I, I think you know a, a player like me would would have a really hard time being on the field a lot. Uh, I, I, no doubt. I know that feeling. Uh, let's get into the current situation of of college lacrosse. What was your mindset? when this whole thing came crashing down and how long did it take you to get to the level of acceptance in the grieving process? I, I think like most, um, I was shocked that it, that it came to this point. I think I felt as if 
Um, although realizing we were vulnerable, I think I've always felt that it would never get this close to home and that the cancellation of the season would would never happen. And then as, as, as things continue to digress, I think you, you, you do begin to realize that it was a definitive possibility and reality did set in. I think I was always hopeful that the season would uh, begin at some other point or renew at some other point. So it was a it was a shock, no doubt, and um, it it took me you know a couple days really after that first weekend when I you know we were supposed to do a game against Bucknell, and I really had nothing else to do. That I finally began to realize that it's it's over, and, and they were serious about it. One of the questions that I asked you via text to prepare for and it bring it almost gets me choked up to think about thank goodness this wasn't a year ago how cheated would the world of lacrosse have been if this happened a year ago and patrick spencer's senior year had gotten cut short how how awful would that have been not that this isn't awful but that would have been catastrophic in my opinion well, I think, it, I think it would have been awful on a, on a number of levels. Uh, the first one that comes to mind, though, is that you know, Pat really became more of just a, a player in the lacrosse community. And people really started to begin to follow him outside of lacrosse, uh, you know, because of, of his ability to play basketball. Yep. And I think that story really helped to transcend him into, you know, other athletic communities. I think a result of his just athletic ability and how he was playing the game so much differently than we had seen. I think, you know, certainly the lacrosse community would have been cheated out of who many think. I don't know if he was the best player of all time, but he certainly he was a, yeah. a, a very different player than we had seen over the past couple of years. So they would have been cheated. But I think a lot of other people who just enjoyed sports and, and a high level of athleticism would have been cheated as well. It's crazy to think because he is a generational type talent. Uh, and again, you alluded to, is he the best ever? You know, that's an, that's an argument. It's a debate. Uh, you know, certainly Mikey Powell, from a collegiate standpoint, he was the attackman of the year four times. Uh, that's a pretty high establishment. Uh, and we, t- we talk about those vintage games, the Kelly and Associates vintage game. What NCAA game sticks out to you as the best game ever? Can I get can I get two or just one? Sure, you get two. I always yeah, yeah. Believe me, I go three or four. So when I when I when I did this, I I, I didn't really think about. It. I went with the philosophy of I'll just go with whatever pops into my head, and two popped in right away. The '89 national yeah. championship game, Hopkins versus Syracuse, College Park, largest crowd ever to date, beautiful date, the rematch, and Syracuse wins it by one. But what made that one so great to me was that was Dave Petromano versus Gary Gate. And if you remember watching that game, the chess match in the box in ensuring that they were both on the same field at the same time, or really that Dave Petromano was on the field at the same time as Gary Gate. Syracuse ended up winning by one. Hopkins with a late chance oh, yeah. and was denied by Matt Palum. I thought yeah. that was a fantastic game. That, that was one of them. Um... Uh, and that's largely considered the best ever. What's the other one you chose? I, for some reason, book. I just loved that 1992 Princeton game, game oh. over Syracuse for a couple reasons. One was in the way that it was finished with, with Andy Moe and the walk-off. But really, it was the story after that, and you may know this one, in that Andy Moe allegedly never played a game again and when he was done, he went to Lake Carnegie and took his equipment, threw it in the lake. <laughs> and and the mindset there was, I'll never be able to top this moment again. Now, they've asked him about it, and he's a really interesting guy, and he's never said one way or another. <laughs> um, but that you can look that story up. That's a legitimate story, and I found that to be fascinating. So that was number two for me. Now, uh, as we move forward... How will this situation, how will Charlie Toomey, one of my favorite people in the game, how is he going to make this a positive and help Loyola when this is all said and done? So uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I spoke to, uh, I spoke to Charlie last week. Um, they have been spending some time in the office um, doing the, the norm, which is 
going over recruiting, although they can't really do much there, you know, looking at film from this year and preparing for next year. But I think for them, now you may have to help me here. If, if everyone gets an extra year, is that true or no? Yeah, that's what they're, they're right now saying, that everyone gets another year of eligibility. So for Loyola, that's huge because they were playing, at times, six freshmen. So not only do you get a couple seniors to come back, like Peter Swindell, who was really coming into his own offensively. You got Matt Higgins, who was a great home ball defender. But you had six freshmen who were getting considerable time that got a chance to play, prove themselves, but now they get to come back again as freshmen. Uh, that's really, really big for Loyola. That's huge for Loyola. That it's going to be interesting to see what a senior in high school does who was planning on matriculating up to the college ranks. How many of those kids are going to go PG at a school like IMG or a New England prep school because they want to try and preserve their ability to jump on the field uh, when, when some kids do graduate? Uh, we have a segment called the Warrior Player to Player. Gunks, what advice would you give a high school player who is right now trying to become the best possible version of himself? So, um, and I think you've seen a lot of this this week. I think there's a couple things. Um, so, book this week, I've noticed a lot of kids out there working one-on-one with individual coaches. Mm-hmm. Um, we like to use a guy like Tory Casemeyer. Sure. So, I think a, that's a great, this is a great opportunity because the individual coaching can really teach you the nuances associated with really getting separation in your role. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think watching film can be really, really important. And and that can really begin to, to work on the mental aspect of the game. And then none of this stuff is earth shattering, but I also think taking this time to really work on your individual skill set athletically mm-hmm. is, is really paramount. We you know, if you do those three things, I think that you do them really, really well. I think not only is there a place for you in lacrosse today, but I think you can find that you'll have some success as well. Some great words of advice from Chris Gunkel, who's been a broadcaster for Loyola for a long, long, long time after he played uh, for the Greyhounds uh, back in some some great days. And Loyola certainly went on to a, an, an unbelievable year. 2012, talk about the impact that that had on you and the program when they won the national championship. Well, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a, obviously a dream come true, uh, considering we, we weren't able, fortunate enough to win one, and then for Loyola to win it that year was was amazing. I, I didn't know if there would ever be a time that a school like Loyola, with the changing face of lacrosse, uh, would have an opportunity to do so. If you remember, book, you and I did the Delaware game that year, and Loyola wasn't. I don't think they were in the top twenty, or they may have been a low. You know, maybe 19 or 18 team. And it just, I think it showed the lacrosse world that you don't necessarily have to be one of the big boys to win it. That parody was alive and well. I think it did wonders for the school. It put the school on the map. But most importantly, I think it gave a lot of schools hope that you don't have to be a traditional power to be successful now in lacrosse. And for the individual player, because we had a lot of guys like Scott Ratliff, sure. who Josh Hawkins, people didn't know a lot about them. So you didn't have to be an, an inside lacrosse top 50 kid to see success. You know, you can be one of those last kids taken on a roster, like a Pat Spencer, who a lot of people didn't recruit because of early recruiting. And you can still get on a great team and become a great player and produce and achieve things that you never thought you could before. And I'd be remiss if I didn't throw Justin Ward, who graduated as the all-time assist leader at Loyola. He was a part of that 2012 national championship team. I believe they defeated Maryland in the championship 9-3. Is that correct? That's correct. And Justin Ward, we'd be remiss if we didn't say one of the great rough riders. Of all oh, yeah. That is, that is true. That is true. I appreciate that. Gunk, and we're up a, a great human being. It, it, phenomenal. And Gunk, we're up against the break. I love having you. I love doing games with you. Uh, I don't know that we'll do another one this spring, but we will definitely bring you on uh, again sometime soon. Thanks so much for the time. Thanks, Paul. I really appreciate it. Take care. You got it. Uh, We are up against the break. We're going to step away. We'll have Jerry Byrne when we come back.
The Fellowship of Christian Athletes engages their coaches and athletes to grow their faith through sport. Make sure you investigate the amazing camp at Lebanon Valley College this July. The FCA has camps, clinics, huddles, teams. Learn more about the Fellowship of Christian Athletes by going to fcalax.com. time with me who am i what i mean what have i accomplished it's not like i have some big long list of accomplishments let's get somebody on the phone who is a star coached at notre dame for decades with my cousin kev now he's the head coach at harvard and he is jerry Byrne. he is absolutely fabulous and he is on the line coming up here. Your call cannot be completed at this time. That obviously is not what we wanted to hear. Now it's ringing. Yo. Coach Jerry Burns, you are live on the Booker Corrigan Show. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is, my friend to have you on. Uh, what's your mindset right now as we go through these completely uncharted waters? Well, I'm just, you know, it's very comforting to be on the phone with you because <laughs> your positive outlook and yeah. positive vibes and you only got one chance at today. I love I love to hear that. Uh, Burns, yes, I, I was bringing you on. I talked about your decades of work at Notre Dame, uh, talk a little bit about your connection with Coach Kevin Corrigan, and then, of course, feel free to bring up my godfather, Papa Gene, Gene Corrigan. Yeah, no, listen, you know, I can't get away from the Corrigans. <laughs> they've, been, uh, they've been instrumental <laughs> in my in my life. Um, you know, Big Kev and, and my brother Steve, we're roommates at, at Virginia. Now, granted, Kev was on the seven-year plan, and, and and Steve was on maybe the four-and-a-half-year plan, uh, public school guys. So, um, you know, so I, you know, connected through, and then through you, and and playing with G.T. Corrigan, your, your brother out in Vail, for many years, and, right. you know, uh, your, uh, your big green, your dad, the whole time. Great, used to take me out. The Green Monster. The Green Monster, <laughs> taking me out for uh, lunch in New York City many times and when I worked in Manhattan. And, um, you, know, you know, coming back out to South Bend and um, connecting with Kev and, and coaching uh, my godson, Will, who, you know, coaches with me at Harvard now. So, yeah, the Corrigans, and then, you know, going to, you know, Gene's, uh, services a few weeks ago, you know, talk about a life, you know, your godfather, yeah. uh, Gene Corrigan, um, just, you know, the, and not in the sense of like, wow, the, the, the depth and breadth of people who are at his service, but, you know, what a life he lived and the effect that he had on people, his kindness and his civility, his humanity, and, you know, I think he is in the pantheon of the great athletic directors of all time, for sure, but also how many lives he impacted, you know, with how he was as a person and as a manager of people. I think it was critical to success. I don't think there'll be another athletic director like him in college athletics ever again. And you look at his, the tree of people that he 
has impacted, you know, whether it's the athletic director at Duke or Ohio State or Wisconsin. Or, or NC State. Or, you know, <laughs> or NC State, right? Another car against Jesus, they're everywhere. So, uh, but yeah, no, your you're, you're godfather was uh, one of the all-time great men of the last 50 years. He was, and I know you guys were playing in a national championship game uh, about five years ago, and Johnny Mosley, who was a, a football player at Notre Dame, sure. came down to watch the game. I actually picked him up at the Baltimore train station and drove him down, went to the ESPN trailer to get the, our credentials together, and we walked from, you know, we walked about a, a mile from where we parked just because he and I are both, you know, kind of the same ilk. We don't want to park in the masses. We'll just walk. And on the walk, he, he repeatedly told me these great stories of Papa Gene's ability to connect to people. And he would sit down and have lunch with him, you know, once every two weeks and just say, okay, Johnny, tell me the vibe of what's going on. Tell me what we need to look at. You know, don't, I'm not looking for things that, you know, might've happened on a Saturday night. I'm looking at the way practice ends on a Tuesday or how you're getting ready for a practice on Friday. And what's the vibe on the team? And and he said that Johnny told me that Gene had such a calm demeanor that it was easy to sit down and flow into the, the good things and, and things that might need to be addressed. And that's advice that a lot of coaches uh, might need to hear. Uh, what are some of the things that you've adapted into your coaching style now? Uh, you were the head coach at San Anselm a, a couple of years ago, but now you're the head coach at Harvard. What are some things that you've taken with you from other coaches and how have you benefited from them? You know, listen, I think, you know, your, your, your cousin Kev, who I was with for a long time, you know, you, your, your godfather, Gene Carr, you know, you defect on his side, obviously, and his style of, of coaching and, and management. And, you know, I think the thing... Probably, you know, and I, even I, I spent most of my life not coaching, you know, not being a coach, and being in the professional world. And the, you know, one probably the, the, the critical thing that I think I brought to Harvard is to is to trust your assistants and yeah. and learning how to, to to manage but not micromanage to give them autonomy and authority, you know, recognize your own gaps and your own skill set because no, no head coach has a command over the seven to 10 different things that they have to be responsible for. And so what you're looking for is for people who help fill in uh, the, the blind spots and the gaps in your own skill set. And so that, you know, I, you know, Coming from the corporate world, going to business school, you kind of you kind of learn those things and less from a textbook and more from you know just paying attention to what's going on in the world and the, whether it's the um, um, you know Gibbs, the coach, former coach of the Redskins, who's now morphed into NASCAR, mm -hmm. you know Jack Welch, you know the, the people who have had tremendous success. You try to take a little bit from reading different articles and different, whether it's a sports magazine or a business magazine or, you know, case studies that you had to do when you were in grad school. So I try to take some of that and at the same time, trying to be practical around and being self-critical enough to know what you're not good at. And you try to get better at it because you don't want to ignore right. those shortcomings, but also backfill them with, with people who have abilities and, and, characteristics and skills that you don't have. So I think that, you know, in the short time that we've all been in Cambridge, I think what I've tried to foster is that collaborative startup mentality. You know, we, we had a huge table in our office at Harvard that I hated, but it was this massive table that you could fit like 10 people at where we didn't work out of our offices. We worked for the first couple of months and we all sat at this this main table, this community table together and we invite the strength coach and we invite the trainer and we invite our compliance person and invite our marketing person. And they, they would just come and we were just doing this 
startup, collaborative, you know, inclusive, idea generating vibe. And then, you know, we've slowly moved out of that. We've kept that mentality, but our jobs and our responsibilities have become much clearer. But in the beginning, when we started in the middle of July, we had to finish a recruiting class. We had to get ready for the next recruiting class, trying to put on some events in September. It was, it was mayhem, but it was, it was focused mayhem and, and purposeful uh, that. So those are the lessons I think I've, I've learned and, and, and the, the goals I've tried to bring in the, in the seven, eight months we've been together. Love to hear about the collaborative effort with all of those other coaches, not just the offensive and defensive, but the strength coach and the recruiting coach, the, the marketing guy. We're on the MedStar Coaches Hotline with Coach Jerry Byrne from Harvard. Uh, coach Byrne, let's look backwards and talk about the Kelly and Associates vintage game. Uh, what is the best NCAA championship game in your mind? What's the one that if you could watch one right now, what are you going to watch? Um, I don't know if I can answer that question because I'm, you know, I'm that guy that if I'm, if I'm not playing in it or coaching in it, <laughs> I'm going to try to do everything I can to avoid the fact that that is actually happening. Um, you know, listen, the, the people will say this is an easy one, but, you know, listen, the, the two, we had two, we meaning their name, coaching in their name, we had two unbelievable games with with Duke, one where they led and we, you know, got it down to one goal with, you know, 20 seconds left in the game and they were able to hold off and, and then another one in 2010 that people think, is a horrible game because it ends up being six <laughs> five in, in overtime. But you know, you know, last time you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about whether the Sands liked the game or not. You know, that game we were up whatever five three with you know in the third quarter or early fourth quarter, and so there wasn't a lot of scoring. But that doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't a great game. We missed the cage a lot, and Scott Rogers had a really good game and unbelievable battles at the face off. So. You know, I'm, I I can only look through the prism of the games that we're involved with. I don't. They were, you know, it's disappointing to lose to get that close, but better to be have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. And so, yeah. it's it's fortunate to be in the middle of those games. I, I really, you know, the uh, it's not a championship game, but I I think, you know, the the Notre Dame Albany 2014 game at Hofstra. Yeah, well, I don't yeah. think there's a better lacrosse game as far as drama and subplots and you know how talented the Thompsons were and you know Notre Dame going up early in that game four to nothing Albany coming back to go up 14-9 in the fourth quarter or 13-8 whatever it was and and then Notre Dame coming back and to, to win in overtime you know I don't think there's been too many games that had that many back and forth and and momentum swings and, you know, had a lot of really good players in that game. Matt Cavanaugh, Matt Landis, the three Thompsons, Blaze Reardon, you know, Nick Costello, you know, I mean, just had a crazy amount of uh, Sergio Perkovic, Jim Marlott, you know, crazy amount of talented All-American players. And so, you know, not a championship game, but sure, that may, that may be the most thrilling game I've ever been involved with that yeah I remember watching that game because I you know I have an aversion to Long Island although I do love Levittown cross the T's and dot the I's and don't forget it don't don't forget it (laughs) Uh, let me ask this question what advice are you giving your players present players and past players that you've had the chance to talk to ever since this whole scenario unfolded on us you know, uh, I think this is a I think this is a real test of 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 focus and and discipline, and that that's for everybody, not just the players on your team, your student athletes on your team. You have the disruption of your season, then you got that followed by the disruption of your academic year, mm-hmm. then you have the disruption of you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Yeah, I've heard that Please. somewhere. And, and now you're back home, and maybe, 
you know, listen, you know, even for colleges, when you start, you know, separating those those ties to home and you're learning your independence, now you're back to dependence. You're back with your, your mom and or your dad and you are under that roof again. And listen, you know, the, the romantic side of everyone is that's going to be a gleeful homecoming and things like that. But we all know living in small houses that it's going to be hard, you know, it's going to be hard. And so all of those things, and now you're doing your classes on your computer and, you know, the lure of your bed is right there and the lure of Netflix and yeah. all these distractions and your phone and you're in a smaller house and, you know, the dog and it's really hard. It's just going to really test your, your focus and your discipline. So, you know, my message out to our team is do everything you can to replicate your normal day. You know, your classes at your class time. You're studying at your study time. You're working out when you would typically do your work with your team. You're watching film when you're watching film. So everything you can do to replicate your day, your normal day when things are abnormal, that'll that'll be a comforting thing. It'll it'll help de stress you and 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 make your day a little bit more normal when it couldn't be any further from normal. <laughs> and so that's that's the advice that I'm giving. And control, you know, control the controllables, how you eat, how you sleep, you know, I think reading and engagement, does, even though your engagement face to face and, and human to human is disappearing, it doesn't mean you cannot, you know, reconnect with, with people and you know, whether it's on the phone or across the fence or going for a walk, whatever you're allowed to do in your your area, you need to do those things because, you know, your world is small geographically now, but it doesn't necessarily have to